Welcome, dear viewers. My name is Silas Grenya. I'm a counseling psychologist. We are gathering here every Monday uh, from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, today we had a technical challenge <laughs> a bit, and so we will take this moment uh, to discuss about a few things that actually can give us some hope uh, in life. So we'll start with the prayer as usual, and then from there we'll be able to move on uh, to the topic of today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come by the means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate of Mary, your well beloved spouse. Come, Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation. And may you come and uh, teach us, and so that whatever we experience and hear will transform our lives eternally. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So usually we meet here every Monday to discuss about uh, family life and we know very well that in family there are so many experiences that people go through and sometimes you do not know really how to grapple with that. For example, in the past I have mentioned about bipolar disorder which is a mental illness that affects the way we think, we feel and the way we act. But also at the same time there are so many other challenges, substance use that we are seeing in families early pregnancies, we have issues uh, of uh, violence, we have sicknesses in our families, poverty, um, you know, people uh, not following the right path in life, seeing a lot of challenges in families. All these are normal and they are common to human beings. And so today I would want us to, to discuss a little bit about how do we deal with such events when we face them in our lives. The question is, is this biblical? Is it something that uh, is abnormal? Is it what is expected for human beings? Of course, I think as long as you're born in the world, then you are prone to facing these challenges of all manner, of all kinds. And for example, if you look at the Bible, the Word of God tells us very well in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, the word of God says that come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. Learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my cross, or something like that. Jesus is referring to us, calling us who are overburdened, because he understands clearly in this world there are a lot of burdens. For example, you're the firstborn in the family, and you are the only one who has probably got a job. And so everybody else is expecting you to come and support them. You have to support your brothers and sisters, younger brothers and sisters. Sometimes even those, um, you know, they themselves are not so concerned about their lives. Some of them are into substance use. Others, you take them to school. They don't want to go on with school. The first important also sometimes you find yourself supporting even your families, your parents. And so all these challenges can be so overwhelming. But also as Christians, as we try to live our Christian life, there are so many challenges also that we face. For example, you want to live your faithful life, but then you realize your partner is not as faithful as you are. And that's a challenge as a Christian. As a Christian also, you want to bring up your children in the right way. But then you go ahead and realize there's a teacher who was employed in a school, and he has started teaching new, um, uh, new knowledge, which really is not essential for the children. For example, the other day there was um, a lobby uh, to be able to, uh, you know, bring, introduce into our curriculum the sexual education, the sexuality education, which is a good thing if you look at it. It's actually important for our children to learn who they are, to learn about their sexuality, which is fine. But then the problem is, what is the intention of this lobby? Because like, for example, I looked at uh, the proposed curriculum and what I saw was really, really, really terrifying. And they were saying that this sexuality education is supposed to be uh, education that is age sensitive, which, which is a beautiful statement because it looks like when you're two to five years, maybe there's something that will be taught, which is actually uh, proper to that stage. And then when you get to uh, ages, maybe 12 to 15, again, there is a, 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 a lesson that you're taught in that area, which again is okay. But then when I looked at it keenly, what is the material to be taught? For example, I remember there is one phase that we are talking about um, 
um, you know, sexuality uh, to a, a young children, eight to, I mean, five to eight years old, five to eight years old. And this is what they say. The first statement begins very well by saying, uh, uh, teaching now, that you may notice that there are differences in terms of your body, which is okay, because at that age, a child knows a boy, a difference between a boy and a girl. And there are differences in terms of the body appearance, which is okay. Then the second statement, they say that uh, there are some parts of the body that are pleasurable. Now, that I have a problem with it. Because we are talking about five to eight years old. Why are you talking about pleasure at this point? And then after that, they say it, it, it is okay to touch those parts of the body and enjoy their pleasure. Five to eight years old. And then it continues and says that when you touch those parts of the body and you wrap them, that is called masturbation. And they say masturbation has no problem whatsoever as long as you don't masturbate in public. And so the lesson ends there. So you were a Christian. You want to bring up your family in a very, very upright way. But then this is what your child is taught. So what will happen to that child? They will start touching their body. They will, touch they will start experimenting what they have been taught. And after that, there will be disaster. We we'll start seeing, um, uh, you know, addictions to masturbation, to pornography, and to so many other things. We will have early pregnancies, and many other things will happen. So these are the challenges that Christians face. You want to tell the truth, maybe in a court, but you realize there are threats. You want to, 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 to go and get your job in, in the right way, but you notice that you are asked for money, for bribes. These are the challenges that Christians are facing. And these things do not only happen in the world. They actually happen in the church. And so that's why we ourselves as Christians find ourselves in a place where the world is not friendly. But there is hope. Because Jesus himself says clearly in his word in John, he tells us that if I, who is your master, I have been persecuted. So what will happen of you? He put it this way, there is no student who is greater than the master. If they, have, they have done this to the master. What will happen to you? And so that means even for us as Christians, challenges are no more part of life. Persecutions are no more part of life. And like, for example, you trying to go against the current, that is already against what the world wants. And when we come with those concepts, we usually face a lot of challenges here and there, and opposition will be there. But one beautiful thing I notice also in the Bible, if you read the word of God in the Acts of Apostles, it says clearly that the disciples were being persecuted. And the reason why they are being persecuted, not because they were evil people, not because they were making people fight, but they were persecuted because they would teach, and then because they had so much faith, the word of God would begin to perform miracles. And people were always being converted and changed. For example, I look at what happened in, um, in, in the Acts of Apostles chapter 2, where, when there was the coming of the Holy Spirit. We see that John, I mean, Peter stands to tell the people, actually I call it announcement, he stood to make an announcement to tell people that these guys are not drunk. They are filled by the Holy Spirit and he teaches them very well. And we are told that they were cut into the heart and they asked, brother, what shall we do? And then John and Peter tells them, repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. And we are told that 3,000 people actually were baptized on that particular day. Which then clearly tells us great things were happening, not bad things, good things, that would transform the lives of people. In chapter 3, they go and they meet the man who was crippled always at the gate of the temple. They give, they, he asks them, what I mean, give me what you have, and then Peter and John say, what we have is what we are going to give you. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And this man is healed and his life is restored. And that began the journey of persecution for them. But we are told every time they went, wherever they ran away after persecution, they would go and evangelize. So usually we say that the normal condition of evangelization, the normal conditions of living Christian life, the normal environment of living Christian life, is basically an, an environment of opposition. And so when we face all these oppositions, do not be discouraged. Because, like for example, what we read the word of God yesterday in Psalms 147 verse 3, it says clearly that the Lord 
bounds or binds the brokenhearted. He consoles those who are brokenhearted. Meaning that he understands clearly that we are going to go through a lot in I mean a lot of challenges in this life, but he is there. He wants to console us and to journey with us. And so, my brothers and sisters, wherever you are, it doesn't matter what challenge you're going through, it is important to understand that this is the normal condition of being a Christian. But there is hope for us because the Lord is there to encourage us all the time. He told his disciples that I will be with you to the end of time. Have you gotten to the end of time? He also says that with me, everything, everything is possible. Or for those who have faith, nothing is impossible for them. When we have faith, what happens is we are able to tap the, the ordinary things that happen in heaven, which to us on earth, they look extraordinary, but they become ordinary because we have faith. So that means whatever challenges we are going through, because we have faith, that faith actually transforms our lives. I also hear the word of God again in Hebrews, chapter, I think it's chapter 12, verse 2. Again, it says that Jesus is the, the beginner of our faith, but also is the finisher of our faith. So that means when we have faith in the Son of God, then the Son of God is constantly alive in us, is alive around us. So he lives with us and constantly journeying with us, going through what we went through ourselves. There is one statement I look, for example, when Jesus and gone to pray in the garden uh, at night. And one of the things that he says is that my heart is, 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 so, is so sorrowful, even to a point of death. Because he could see what he was going to go through in the next few hours. And so Jesus himself was at that point. I also look at what happened when Lazarus died. Jesus also cried, wept. That means Jesus he also went through what we go through. And he wants to come and be with us in our challenges because he understands us very well. He is a high priest who is able to understand our challenges because he himself has been through our challenges. And so whatever you're going through, my brother, my sister, just know that Jesus is with you. Practice your faith, which makes things alive. Because if you look at the definition of what faith is, I think it's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says that faith is hope for the things that have not been possessed. But you actually live as if you have already possessed them. So that means even if you are going through anguish because you have lost a job because of this pandemic, or because your relationship is not doing very well, or probably you have had miscarriage, or there is someone using substance in your family, and you don't know how to help them, it is the moment to have faith in God. So that God himself, who brings things that are not actualized in our eyes, those things that are, have, not, have no physical evidence now, he makes them become alive in our own lives. Also become a personal prayer. Prayer is a tool that I think so many people probably tend to think doesn't work. But prayer is one thing that changes everything. Prayer is one thing that governs God. I think you have heard that me say that statement before. That God is the one who governs the earth and the universe. But prayer can actually govern God. Not that the prayer will be able to control God, but because he's a God of justice. So when he says what you pray for, whatever you ask for, I will give it to you. Then when you ask for something, he gives you. Unless we ourselves have not disposed ourselves in a way that to we, are, we are ready to receive that gift of God. And so I encourage you from wherever you are, whatever it is you are going through, grappling with mental illnesses, grappling with whatever challenge that you're going through, turn to the Lord and let the Lord support you. The other thing that is key, I think, is the mindset. We have two kinds of mindset. We have fixed mindset and growth mindset. Fixed mindset believes that you are born with things, you are born with knowledge, you are born with skills, and if you don't have, if you are not born with, then you cannot possess it. And that is a very, very bad mindset because it means you cannot develop yourself. You can only survive through what you have. And how many of us have everything that we need in life? So the growth mindset believes that even though you may not have something, you can actually work out until you get there. This kind of mindset believes when you face a challenge, is a springboard for you. 
to be able to overcome the challenges that are taking place and to improve yourself as a person. The other thing is change your perception. Perception is basically what I call the, 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 the lenses. When you put on the green lenses or the red lenses, whatever it is that you see, you will actually be seeing green or black. Even if it's a, a, a white thing, when you put on uh, red uh, lenses, they will see red everywhere, even in the white things. So we need to work on our perspective, on our perception, our interpretation of the world, so that we can look at things in a more positive way. We say that you become what you eat. So if you find on the negative information, then it means, at the end of it all, you'll be filled with negative emotions and negative energy and negative behavior. But if you fill yourself with positive emotions, I mean positive thoughts, they will transform to positive emotions and positive behavior. That is another element that you can work on in your life, feed constantly. Like, for example, the church fathers, they teach, they teach us very simple prayers, uh, what they call the prayer of Jesus, or those simple ejaculations that we pray or inspiration prayers. For example, you say, I am stronger, uh, the one in me is stronger than the one in the world. That is a, a, a Bible verse which is so powerful that when you're facing a lot of challenges, you can keep on repeating that. Or you can choose actually to say that this problem is so big and so I don't know what to do, which will bring in helplessness. So the best way would be turn to the word of God, let the word of God empower you. One thing I should say about the word of God, we are told that everything that was created was created through the word. And today, actually, when we are reading the scripture today, the Bible is taking us back to the Genesis, to the creation. Let there be. And of course, there was something. So when God says something, it becomes. The word of God brings a reality, makes things actualize or become alive, even that which is not alive. And so when you use the word of God for, for encouragement, then even that which is not existing as in us or in our, our, our environment, it is supposed, it begins to take life because we believe in the word of God. And so that's why, for example, when Mary is told, um, you are the mother of God, and, and she asks, how will it be, be possible? She is told, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, overshadow you. She takes that seriously. And what happens? The child, baby Jesus, begins to form in her because the word of God that was communicated created anew. And so for us, when we believe in the word of God, follow the word of God, read the word of God, the word of God is able to empower us so that real, new realities can begin to happen in our lives. You, do you wonder sometimes, for example, how can a priest just say, let this bread uh, become body and blood of Jesus? I mean, uh, the, the bread and the wine. How do they become um, body and blood of Jesus? It is because of the power of the word that is spoken through the Holy Spirit. So it means that that one can change the substance of the bread to the substance of the body of Jesus. And that's why the one that is using there is substantiation, meaning the substance of the bread is changing to a substance of the body, uh, of the body of Jesus. The substance of the wine changes to the substance of the blood. That means the power that is spoken by the priest through the ordination and through the grace of the Holy Spirit, it's able to transform that. And so even for us, when we make our prayers, our prayers will be able to transform situations that are changing. So there should be there a person in our family who is using substance, as much as we are taking them for therapy, as much as we are taking them for rehabilitation, let us also make a prayer for them. That prayer can get into them and transform their lives. Because it is not us anymore when we make a prayer. It is God himself who is acting at that moment. And so that is my closing remarks for today. Uh, I know we'll be here next uh, week on Monday. And we'll be able to discuss much more about depression. But I encourage you, have hope in God. And when you have hope, new realities will begin to take place in your life. Hope, you don't have to see what you hope for. Because if you see what you hope, hope for, then you, you, you don't need to hope anymore. Because you can see it. Like, I don't have to hope that this is my, my, my head. Because, I mean, I can see it, I can touch it. I can touch it, so I don't need to hope. I only hope that after this, I will get home safe. That is hope that I have. And because there is that hope, and it's the hope that is working with the Word of God, then that hope is able to create a reality to make me get to where I want to be. Otherwise, when you have hope, you will not be helpless. Now, with, I have treated people with depression for a very long time and mental illnesses. 
One of the key things they experience is hopelessness. And so I have also realized that where there is hope, there is no depression. Because depression and hope do not go together. So my dear friend, hope in God, trust in God, be a person of prayer, and keep trusting. And God will guide you himself, who calls you, come to me, or you relabor and are overburdened, and don't give you rest. The only rest that you can have is in Jesus. Most of us try to get rest from substance, rest from other kind of behaviors, but that will never solve our problems. It is only Jesus who can give us hope. Thank you. God bless you.